Good morning and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. I'm Sue Eid, one of many of Faith's lay worship leaders. Let's begin by seeing how many of us can say our mission statement together without looking at the screen. Faith United Methodist Church is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship, education, mission, and fellowship. All right, we get an A. Today we're taking a break from our summer series, The Gospel of John, but we will resume that when Pastor Caleb returns. <clears throat> On Thursday, we learned Pastor Sandberg who was scheduled, if you can see it in your bulletin, to give the message today has COVID and is quarantined. On such short notice, Pastor Josh. <laughs> graciously offered to present the message today. Unfortunately, there was not enough time to make changes like in the bulletin uh, and the liturgy uh, will go along with what Pastor Sandberg was going to present, but we'll get through this. Uh, and, and of course, we wish Pastor Jim Sandberg uh, a quick recovery, and I'm sure you're going to hear his message at some time in the future. Today's scripture is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to our God forever and ever, Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white? And where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. And he said to me, these are who have come out of the great ordeal that have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Uh, it's so great to be with you all today, and um, as Sue shared, uh, we were supposed to have uh, Pastor Jim Sandberg share a message this morning on Revelation, and, um, and uh, Jim let us know that he was, uh, he, he was uh, tested positive for COVID. He sounded like he was doing fine, but he had to quarantine, and we're grateful for that, but, and he'll, he'll be back to share that message with you at some point, I'm sure. But I was not feeling bold enough to preach from Revelation today. So <laughs> we're really uh, glad that Barry was sharing the scripture with us. It's always good to hear from that, that book that we don't always turn to as often as maybe it warrants. But today, uh, we're going to talk about happiness and specifically what Jesus has to say about happiness in a passage of the scriptures that we probably are pretty familiar with, the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Uh, and we're also going to contrast that with what are some of the, the stories that our world, our culture, tries to uh, tell us about where happiness comes from, about what true happiness is. And does Jesus mesh with that or does Jesus challenge that a little bit? So uh, before we begin, I'm going to invite you to join me just in a, a quick prayer. Dear Lord, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be glorifying and honoring to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So do you want to be happy? Do you want to be happy? I feel like I should see everybody's hands up in the air. Um, there was a philosopher, it might have been uh, Kant, who said, if, if somebody says no to that question, they're lying. Happiness is a word we use for what we all want. We all want to be happy. So let me ask another question. Are you happy? If you're like me, and you hear that question, you start to think a little bit. And you go, well, you know, maybe I'm feeling a little anxious about some things lately. That's certainly weighing on me. And yet I know I have enriching relationships that are really nurturing and good, and I'm grateful for them. And so, boy, I don't know if, if this is a simple question for you, but for me, I go, I start to go, I don't know that I necessarily know what happiness is. I don't know that I really know what it would mean to say yes or no. It's actually more complicated. It seems like it should be the most obvious thing in the world, but for me anyway, it just isn't. Life is complicated. Well, if you are like me, if you're not, if it's very simple, that's great, but if you're like me, then you're not alone because throughout the ages, people have debated through ancient days up till today. They've debated what does it really mean to be happy. One of the ancient philosophers even said, you can't determine that you were happy until your whole life has been lived, which, you know, that sounds a little rough, but, but they were trying to think like, what is the good life? What are we here for? What are we oriented to? What makes us happy? What brings us fulfillment in life? These are big questions, and they're fairly complicated. So people have talked about this subject throughout history. And Jesus also has some things to say. And we hear them in his Beatitudes, in those sayings that we have in the, the Sermon on the Mount uh, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. And so we're going to we're going to turn our attention to those uh, at some point. But first, I wanted to start by just attending to what I think are two of the several predominant views or stories about what happiness is that we might hear in our culture. And so one of them is that happiness comes from material wealth, from stuff, from having uh, enough, from uh, the, the idea that money can buy us happiness. Now, I know I think most of us probably in our heads go, well, we know that's not true. That's not where happiness comes from. But we've probably all found ourselves in circumstances at one time or another where we felt this. If only I had X, Y, Z, everything would be okay. If only I had this, then I would be, and we might even use that word, happy. This is a message that gets spoken to us in so many different ways. And so while we might deny it with our heads, we need to know that it gets, it, it gets into our system, right? We, we can tend to kind of believe it in our gut. And there's a pretty good reason for that. This is a message that, that advertising focuses on, that, that there's, there's money poured into convincing us that this is the route to happiness. This is the good life. And so if we were to trust television commercials, for example, then happiness is a leather interior, and zero to 60 in 2.4 seconds. That is happiness. Now, I have to admit, recently I was behind the wheel of a car with really good acceleration, and it was a lot of fun. I realized that actually next week is the 15th birthday of my gray Toyota Prius. 
And so for me, this experience of fast acceleration was really new and especially thrilling. I can't deny it. And I had to pay some special attention to the speedometer more than usual. And so I was bummed when I had to return this car. But I realized I have a sense or, or a guess that if I drove this car every day, the thrill might start to wear off. It probably felt especially thrilling because it's not something I do all the time. We've all experienced this, right? More, bigger, faster can feel really great for a time, but it doesn't last. Have you ever looked at the television set that maybe you watched 15 or 20 years ago or maybe even more? A television maybe that at the time it was the newest, biggest, shiniest thing and it felt like more screen space than you'd ever need in your whole life. And now, compared to some of the new models at the local electronics store, it looks really small by comparison. And you could almost swear that it's not the same TV or it must have shrunk in the last 15 years, right? You, we've had that experience. Do bigger TVs and faster cars make us happy? Now, it's not to say that there aren't real tangible benefits from these things. There are qualitative benefits, and let me just explain one. I've been a big hockey, ice hockey fan since I was a kid. Anybody watching the Stanley Cup Finals right now? Maybe some of us. Well, I was really hoping they'd lift the cup a couple of nights ago, but maybe tonight they're going to uh, celebrate a championship. I don't know. But when I was a kid, I'd watch it on TV, and there was, a, there was something that was really important about hockey that you couldn't see on those TVs at the time. You could not see that small black rubber disc. You couldn't see the puck on the television set because we didn't have TVs big enough or with high enough resolution. And with HD television, all of a sudden, you could see the puck. It qualitatively made watching hockey a better experience. And so there's real qualitative things that we gain from this kind of progress. But that doesn't answer the question. Does it make us happy? We probably wouldn't want to go backward on these things, but it's, it's, the reality is these shiny new things don't have a sustained impact on our happiness. They don't. And actually, there's a term for this. People have come up with this term, the hedonic treadmill. We've got a little graph that sort of shows what this cycle is about. The hedonic treadmill, hedonic for pleasure, and a treadmill meaning we never actually reach the goal. We're just on and on, going and going. And the way it works is we have a desire for something. We strive to obtain that thing, as you can see. We obtain it, maybe. We enjoy it, like that fast car. We adapt to this new reality, and it becomes normal, and we desire more. We find ourselves back on the hedonic treadmill. We adapt to our thrills. We grow accustomed to our levels of pleasure so that they, strangely enough, become less pleasurable. They don't bring us sustained happiness. Most of us today, I think, if we were asked, we would admit, yes, material wealth doesn't in and of itself bring happiness. You can't buy happiness. And yet, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent every year through advertising to convince us that we can. And the way that advertising works these days, I think it's pretty clear that advertisers know that their product, while it might be useful, can't bring happiness. And yet, they know that happiness is what their customers ultimately want. And so what do they do? Well, they set out to associate usually through visual images, their product with the things that can promise a degree of happiness in life, just by association. A hundred years ago, advertising was way simpler. Basically, it was about information. I information wasn't at people's fingertips like it is today, and so advertisers primarily wanted to inform people about what their product actually did. It's a wild idea, I know, but that's the way it worked. If I had a practical need, and I happened upon your advertisement in the paper, and you explained to me how it met that need, we might have a transaction here. We might have success. But almost every commercial that you watch today 
isn't trying to inform you anymore. You can find all the details and the specs that you need. They're actually trying to tell you a story, a vivid, engaging, compelling story about your happiness primarily. And it has very little practical connection to the actual product being sold or the thing being promoted. These advertisements, rather than engaging with your intellect and your ability to think critically and getting you to ask consciously, do I need this thing, want to bypass your critical thinking and move right to your gut, where you begin to feel a certain connection between true and eternal happiness and the next generation iPhone. The next time you're watching television, I want you to just consider this little exercise uh, during a commercial break. Ask yourself if you can discern what is the story about happiness that this commercial is trying to tell me is, is real, is true. Uh, do I believe that story? Is it convincing to me? And if you're watching with a spouse or somebody else who's here today, you both know this assignment. Maybe you could turn to each other and just ask, what do you think the story is? What is this telling us should make us happy? And do we believe that? I think this is actually kind of a subversive act because it engages you in using your mind and rationally considering the argument that the commercial is trying to make, which is exactly what modern advertising doesn't want us to do these days. It just wants us to use our gut and draw those associations and go out and act on that impulse. So, and, and it can even, I think this, this kind of practice can push us to consider the question we're asking. What is happiness? What does it really mean to be happy? And if you do this, you'll likely affirm again that, well, while they're fun, we know money can't buy, material goods cannot obtain and sustain our happiness. As an aside, I don't mean to say by this that having material needs met is not important to our life and to our contentment. Uh, throughout uh, church history, there sometimes have been those voices that have suggested that we don't really need to worry about the body and its needs. And, um, and that's, not, uh, that's not what we affirm as, as Christians and as followers of Jesus. People have basic needs. And usually when we talk about the happiness that money can buy, we really mean the worry and the anxiety and the real deprivation that money can alleviate, which is important. For most of us, when we find ourselves saying, if I only had a million dollars, then I'd be happy, what we really mean is, uh, and what we really believe, is that there won't be as much worry in our lives about how our basic needs will be met. We don't have to worry about that, and likely our worries will attend to other things in our lives. And many have found joy in helping others to meet those basic needs and to have enough. So, um, you know, as Christians, that's not what we uh, intend to say. We don't deny the importance of our material needs. But we do affirm that happiness doesn't come from more, more, more. We know this to be true. And yet, it's, there's a it's a lot of work to fend off the messages that try to convince us otherwise. Now, there's a second narrative that has emerged, I think especially powerfully, maybe in the last decade. It's probably always been with us, but it's gained a lot of ground in the last 10 or 15 years. And that is this idea that happiness comes from other people believing that I'm happy. When I can convince other people that I'm living the good life, that's how I know I'm living the good life. What do I mean by that? Well, we are always on display today more than ever before in life. We have the ability to broadcast our lives to the world from our phones at any given moment. And what we have seen as a result of this, I think, maybe this is truer for younger generations, but I think we all, it touches us all to some degree. What we've seen is a shift in the usage of these tools like social media and newer technologies that, are, that fit into our pockets a shift from maybe its original or best intent, which was to simply share the events of our lives with our family and our friends and our loved ones who might have a loving interest in us and our joy and the, the, way, the things that we're experiencing in life. That's good. But we've seen a bit of a shift to carefully curating the image of the events of our lives 
for others to see, maybe even for others to desire and possibly even envy. We have become trained up in the art of advertising our very lives, finding ways to present them and portray them in the most convincing way possible. This has always been a part of celebrity culture, to present the celebrity life as desirable, as a way of selling a product, usually, as a way of promoting something. But this way of curating one's own life image is now something that each of us wrestle with, even if we're not famous. You've heard the phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did it make a sound? Today we wonder, if I have a rich and fulfilling experience in my life and I do not capture and share it with photos and videos, did it really happen? I distinctly remember, maybe a little over a decade ago, my wife and I had the chance to visit the Louvre in France, and we saw the Mona Lisa, right? The actual Mona Lisa. It's up in this glass case. And, um, you know, I've probably seen thousands of images and snapshots of the Mona Lisa throughout my life ever since I was a kid. We all have. But here was the real, actual Mona Lisa in front of us. And it, it was a big deal to be there in its presence, and it was really cool, this significant uh, piece of art history. Uh, but there was something really peculiar about the experience as we were there, because it was this room of people all gathered, looking at the same thing, and, and most folks had their phones up in the air to take a snapshot of the Mona Lisa, which might at first feel like a natural impulse, but the one thing I did not need was more images of the Mona Lisa. We've seen a million of them. But I did it too, and it was something that we, probably everyone in that room felt our experience of this. Just seeing this firsthand is not enough. We need to capture it. We need to prove that we are here. And there was just something so ironic about it because it was the one chance we had to just be there and look at the thing. It doesn't come out of nowhere, though, that we desire other people's affirmation of us, other people's validation of us. We are social creatures. It's the way that God made us. We're made to need each other, to rely on each other, to be interdependent, and our desire for social validation is perfectly natural. But I fear that this aspect of our nature has been somewhat hijacked, especially today. We're tempted to elevate other people's affirmation of our image of happiness, projecting happiness, far above our own real experience of happiness. Or to put it another way, we're in danger, I think, of prioritizing the living of an enviable life, which is based on other people's perceptions, over the living of the good life, the happy life, which has its own reality apart from what other people think, and which is itself, it, it may not inspire envy or covetousness from onlookers. It may be something that we just know in ourselves. So our material gain doesn't make us happy, though having material needs uh, being met can alleviate much of suffering and worry in life. And for hockey fans, high-definition televisions can help us to actually see the puck, which is nice. And other people believing that we're happy and seeing our projection of a happy life also doesn't make us happy, even if it inspires envy in others or may even decrease their joy and contentment in their own life by comparison to our projected image. Neither of those things make us happy. So what does real happiness look like? Jesus has a picture of this for us which most of us have heard if we've been in the church for any length of time. We've probably heard these sayings that are captured in what's known as the Beatitudes. These are a series of sayings that open up Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, and, and I want us to just uh, see them up on the screen, and we're going to read them out loud together along with the introduction there. So let's read these together. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mount. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. All right, that's probably pretty familiar to some of us. Maybe we've heard it in a new way today. But let me just mention a couple of things off the bat. First off, notice that these sayings of Jesus do not match either of the previous two pictures of happiness that we talked about. Jesus' picture of happiness is not based on material abundance here and now, and it's not likely to inspire a lot of envy from our neighbor. In fact, it subverted expectations of happiness even thousands of years ago at the time. As they were debating happiness, nobody was saying what Jesus was saying happiness looked like. And there's a lot to unpack here. And we could have a sermon on each of these Beatitudes. But one thing we see is that many of these uh, uh, current circumstances that Jesus describes as uh, blessed are, are not desirable circumstances in themselves. Poor in spirit. Those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst, those who are persecuted. None of these things are things that we ought to strive after, but they are things that many of us are experiencing even now. And these are the circumstances that Jesus says, you are still blessed when you find yourself in this place. Secondly, you might wonder after hearing those and reading those out loud, you might think, well, Pastor Josh, I thought we were talking about happiness but in that translation and in many of the ones that I've heard, the Beatitudes don't use the word happy. They talk about blessedness. Well, the Greek term sometimes translated blessed and sometimes translated happy is makarios. And that might sound like a little bit of trivia, but it's actually pretty important. Most translations prefer blessed, which sounds extra religious and pious to our ears. But I think it loses some of the connotation of like, this is actually talking about what makes for the good life, what we would want. And so other translations use happy. And in any case, Jesus is plainly speaking about the good life, about the best life, the kind of thing that we mean when we ask ourselves, am I happy? And this is important. The term maintains a connection between happiness and the gift that we receive from another, in this case, God. We're blessed. Our happiness isn't something that we scrape together by our own blood, sweat, and tears. It's something we receive, that we receive from God, something with which we are blessed. We receive a blessing when we're open to receiving what God has to offer. The previous ideas of happiness that we talked about are things that we do ourselves. They're things that we achieve, that we grasp and, and, and grab a hold of in life. But many wise persons have said that happiness isn't something that we can pursue directly. It's something that we might receive in the pursuit of other things. For example, the celebrated psychologist, author, and Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, he knew some things about the sufferings of this world, and he had some real firsthand experience and ability to discern what should truly make us happy in this life and he said this, he said, happiness cannot be attained by wanting to be happy. Wow. It must come as the unintended consequence of working for a goal greater than oneself. This is similar to what Jesus tells us. Blessed are those who are in pursuit of God, God's righteousness and justice, even when the trappings of happiness don't seem to manifest for others to see in their lives. They're not fitting any images of the world's view of happiness, but they're in line with something greater, with the work of God in the world. This is who we're called to be as Christians and as followers of Jesus. Not suffering for suffering's sake, not scorning good things, but always holding God's ways and mission first and foremost. And whatever may come, that becomes our primary interest. We don't scrape 
to claim happiness for ourselves, but we receive it as a blessing, as a beatitude, a chief blessing of a life lived in pursuit, not of happiness directly, but of God, the source of all good things. This is the strange mystery of our faith, which we hold to, which we pursue, which we cherish and believe. And so may we be a church and a community that encourages one another in the pursuit of God first to receive happiness as this blessing from God's hand. Amen? And friends, now I want to invite you to make the sign of a heart and share with your neighbor, God loves you and so do I. God loves you and so do I. And friends, receive now the benediction. Go from this place knowing that you do not need to grasp happiness by your own strength, but be open to receiving God's blessings in your life today, tomorrow, and every day. And share that blessing of that love with your neighbor as you go out from this place today. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.